Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You are listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something that's become common language, especially here in American culture, and that is ADD, ADHD. Many people usually have a good idea what it is, but the question is, what is it really and what do we do about it? On the program today, we'll be talking with an expert who's spent more than 14 years with experiencing ADD and ADHD and working with individuals of all ages who have to live with attention deficit disorder, which also includes a lifetime of personal experience with dealing with it himself. He is also author of books such as Managing the Gift of Your ADD, ADHD Child and Managing the Gift of Attention to Attention Deficit Disorder. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Dr. Kevin Ross Emery. Dr. Emery, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. You bet. Now, ADD, let's talk about what it is exactly. A lot of people pretty much have an idea of what it is, but a lot of times there's a lot more to it than people think than just simply trying to hold one's attention and focus. Tell us about that. Well, you know, and I'm glad that you started with that question because I have a very different uh, definition of ADD than a lot of people do. ADD in of itself is part of the evolutionary process. And it is actually here broadening the bandwidth of humanity. These are individuals that started coming in in growing numbers in the 1850s, Dan, and they were part of the, they, they were part of the 20th century. They were actually the architects of the 20th century, Einstein, Edison, Graham Bell, Ford, and they go right up today to people like Paul Orloff or Stephen Jobs, Will Smith, Robin Williams. And these are people who think differently, are very, very bright, highly creative, uh, tend to be naturally rebellious because they're very bright, uh, and can then move through the world in a, in a way that isn't in sync with what is quote-unquote normal. They kind of rub the world a little raw with their presence. Um, but the, none of these people I met, I, I think I, I've mentioned, uh, I think anybody would say, oh, yeah, they were disabled. Now, I mean, Einstein was called retarded at five, and Thomas Alva Edison was, you know, asked to leave school at the age of 12 because he was deemed inappropriate for education. And Graham Bell was called a village idiot. Mm -hmm. But I think when we look at what they have contributed to humanity and society, we may want to really question this disability label that has become very overused for this population and has been very fueled by people who basically actually get profit. They profit off of having these individuals labeled. You know, and you see such trouble with that, especially in our schools today. All of a sudden now, teachers are psychologists? Well, you know, in the last decade, there's been a 66% increase in the diagnosis of children with ADD, HD. 66%. It's up over 10.4 million. And even that the same agencies like the you know, NIH, National Institute for Health, and other places that do these you know, research studies, give us these figures, will tell you that about 20% of those are clearly misdiagnosed, uh, you know, and are being medicated. So over 2 million kids are being medicated because this label is so easy to get. Mm -hmm. I was on a, another radio show uh, just two days ago, and a caller called in and said, you know, my child went in for 30 minutes and read, uh, with a psychiatrist read all the surveys from the teachers and the parents, and in 30 minutes said, yes, they are. Here is a prescription for Ritalin. And two years later, they discovered that the girl had something else wrong with her. And in fact, the medication had been giving her other health issues. Yes, and I'm hearing about that more and more. And it's becoming more alarming, actually. Yeah, well, you know, and it is. And part of it is we have to look at that, A, it's observational and B, so much of the communication flow is being uh, controlled by pharmaceutical companies. 
they mm-hmm. underwrite the majority of the studies. And the other thing is, is that we have that not only are they underwriting the studies, uh, and uh, you know, but they're putting people out in the field. Uh, one of the top speakers that, had, that went around the country in uh, last year, speaking on ADHD, was paid over 2.5 million dollars in speaker fees by the drug companies to go around and talk about it, making it very clear that medication was truly the best option. You know, so but this person is not saying, hey, I'm here paid by the drug companies. They're saying, I'm an expert in ADD, HD, and you're a bad parent if you don't medicate your child. <laughs> well, nothing like going that route. The next thing you know, he's setting up a booth right there by the door with a meet and greet, and oh, by the way, here you go at a discount. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's really scary. And, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a, a, a true story that happened over a dozen years ago. Again, remember, you know, I know when you announced me, you mentioned that I'd been in the field for over 14 years. So I have a very long history with this. My first book came out in 2000. And so, but back in the early 2001, 2002, uh, I had come across a piece of information that, uh, that the drug companies were actually offering free in-services to schools who couldn't afford to, you know, I mean, teachers have to have continuing ed credits. The drug companies say, here, we'll provide somebody to come and teach you about, you know, ADD, ADHD, uh, and it won't cost you anything, and we're doing this as a service to support public education. Okay, now we know that it's getting deep here, so put on your boots. And so we're going to provide this free service for you. Uh, and they were actually counseling teachers and counselors to say uh, to people, well, if your child is diabetic, would you not put them on insulin? As if this was some kind of correlation that was appropriate. You know, when it, it has, the, the two are not related at all. And I was doing a workshop and I was talking about, you know, be careful. And this woman literally burst out in tears at my workshop and I said, why? And she goes, I was sitting in, uh, you know, a 504 with my child and I had one of the counselors look at me and said, we know this is really tough, but think about it. Now, if your child was a diabetic, wouldn't you give them insulin? She goes, I felt like such a bad parent. They were emotionally blackmailing her. And I saw it live happening. You know, and it's interesting because it's not too uh, far of a stretch when you talk about something like that, for instance, when a uh, when parents, mother or father, hear, you know, your child would make a really good model. Well, you know, that's an emotional blackmailing in and of itself, but this here is obviously a lot more serious. And, you know, it's sort of what is a person to do when they find themselves in a situation like that? Well, you know, part of it is you really want to do your research and you want to look beyond and really think about it because, you know, I have pretty much been the lone voice talking about it as an evolutionary process. I mean, back in 2000, I said in in the first book that we should not have called it ADD. We should have called it CIS, which is cultural inconvenience syndrome, because mm-hmm. that's really why we want to medicate it, because it's culturally inconvenient. But today's parent, you know, it, though I've been a lone voice in the, the perspective of it being an evolutionary process, um, there have been many voices for that whole 14 years that have talked about really look at these other factors. And, and my, one of my favorite words, especially in my new book, is exacerbate. Let's look at what exacerbates this child or this adult from being high energy, highly intelligent, highly creative, highly curious, and, you know, demanding, demanding, verbally demanding in, in the fact that they love to learn, and what exacerbates them from the gift into the curse. And so if parents today want to take, not take just what is the pamphlets of being passed across the desk to them. And I want parents to understand that a few years ago, uh, Chad had written, underwritten a whole program that they were going to take into the school systems to educate people. And Chad is the largest nonprofit organization uh, to support children and adults with ADHD. And they created this whole thing, and it was all approved, and it was going to be funded, and all of this stuff, and it was wonderful. And they had to put halts to it to the last minute when they found out that the primary supporter of Chad was Shire, the producer of Ritland. And when they looked closer at the materials, they were clearly, clearly leading people 
in a direction that, that the whole program, I mean, and hundreds of thousands of dollars have been put into this program. Um, and they had to crash the whole program because it was clearly blatantly so drug supportive. Mm -hmm. And so parents want to be careful. Just because they get a brochure from a nonprofit, who supports that nonprofit? How do they come into existence? Ask better questions. If you have a really bright child, let me tell you, they're asking you better questions. Your job as a parent is to make sure you're asking better questions. Right. Ask the questions. And, and look at all, like, again, the things that exacerbate this and continue to go back and look at your child. Or if you're an adult, look at your employee, look at your spouse who, yes, comes with challenges. Dan, I am not denying there are challenges with this, as there are with all things. Mm -hmm. But look at them and say, is this the next Einstein? Is this the next Edison? Is this the next Stephen Jobs? And am, am, and am I rolling the dice risking that they may be the next cure for cancer or they may be the next you know, person that brings something into the world that just blows out our reality of humanity because I want to drug them up and dumb them down? Mm -hmm. Now, since you have personal experience with this, if you could describe for our listeners what it is, what the ADD mind is like when it is working. You know, what is going on there that sets an ADD, ADH person apart from someone who quote unquote functions normally, if we really know what that means. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Normal n normal is a word that's the size of uh, a pit, the size of Texas. Right, exactly. Um, Someone I, who sits down in a classroom for at least an hour to two hours straight daily, doesn't question, doesn't move, doesn't blink, who listens ardently to a teacher that sounds much like Charlie Brown's teacher does. <laughs> yes, that's perfectly normal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you don't know how many times I've used that as I've been on radio and TV shows and said, and that poor kid is sitting there hearing, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I unfortunately was not one of those children when I was growing up. <laughs> so, yeah. so the ADHD person, first of all, is very driven by wanting to learn. They actually are very curious. They want to learn. They want to understand. And they're poking at things, but they're poking at things which have caught their attention that looks like it, it is of real interest or real value to them. And then instead of, you know, one of their short suits, and this is a place where, this is one place where medication actually does show up that it does create a tangible improvement uh, in the learning factor is that uh, is memorization. The medications out there all help the individuals learn how to memorize. Now, they do not improve comprehension. The studies show again and again, comprehension is not improved. Over the long term, the non-medicated person will do just as well in actual comprehension of information. But in the memorization factor, the medication seems to help them memorize stuff, which tells you a lot about why public education wants you to medicate your child, because they want that child not to have critical thinking skills. They don't want that child to challenge and learn they want that child to memorize and do, as I call it, you know, the vomit system of education, which is what we have. We just shove it down their throat, and we want it to vomit them up in the right order. We don't care if they really learned it. They really understand it, if they can apply it. So what does the ADHD mind do? It goes in, and it says, oh, this interests me. So now I want to pick it up, and I want to play with it like a ball of clay. I want to see if I can shape it. I want to turn it. I want to understand it. What's it made up of? What does it look like? How can I, how can I interact with this piece of information? How can I be, you know, be in relationship with it in a way? And there's always two driving forces to that ADHD mind. One is, if it finds it really interesting, is it wants to share it because ADHD minds are naturally want to teach. They want to share. The other is I'm going to try to reinvent it. I'm going to try to recreate it. I'm going to try to make it better. I'm always going to want to fix and play at it and, and do things. Mm -hmm. um, and so because that mind goes into relationship with the information and it's looking at it in what I say 
from a 360 degree angle, which is not how we think of the mind normally working. It can either do the spatial abstract, you know, uh, type of thinking, or it kind of does the more analytic one after another. But this is actually almost like more of a combination pattern where, again, by moving, uh, the only way I can ever describe it is like moving in a three-dimensional spiral. It's looking at things. Like it's looking at all of the angles, like picking up a piece of information like one would pick up a snow globe and look at it and interact with it and look at it and, and do it. Now, in that thought process, we're also dealing with, with they tend to be very kinesthetic learners, which kinesthetic learners historically have been at the bottom rung. And education is much more geared toward visual learners, audio learners, and kinesthetic is the bottom. ADD, HD minds tend to always have kinesthetic. It's not first, it's second. But it's always a close second. So they're, you know, it's there and they're going back and forth uh, between the two because they want to play with the information because they really want to understand it and they want to do something with it. And they have two settings. They go into hyperfocus or there's multitask. Hyperfocus says, you have caught my attention. You have caught my attention, and I'm here, and I'm going to become an instant expert. I'm going to figure out a better way to do it. I'm going to, you know, somehow spin something off of it. Or I am going to multitask, which means you don't have my full attention. I haven't decided what is the value of it yet. I haven't... Uh, I haven't found anything that's really grabbed my mind. And so from that perspective, it is, um, you know, they are just jumping back and forth like a, a little stone skipping on the top of a pond. And they're kind of like, okay, yep, not so much, yep, not so much, yep, not so much, yep, not so much. So now in this perspective, it's quite interesting because back in the 90s, I had actually picked up a book. It's eight that well, was titled, I believe it was ADD, A New Perspective. And in there, the comparison was made that ADD types tend to be the hunters, and then the rest of the people tend to be the gatherers, the farmers. And as this person was laying out this particular point of view, I thought to myself, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I myself grew up and was labeled or even allegedly diagnosed ADD back in the early 70s. And, of course, I was put on to a medication. And it was suggested that I only use half three times a day. My mother finally took me off. She says, I don't want a robot for a son. We'll just kind of have to deal with whatever the problem is. I took a look at, you know, back in those days at how I was, and I didn't really see myself as abnormal from anybody else. But what I did notice is when it came to the playground, I usually had to be in the lead, you know. I did a lot of moving from school to school uh, growing up because I was my father was part of the military. And so I tended, I couldn't be the kind of child, for instance, you know, here's the new child, uh, welcome class, this is Daniel here, for instance, where I sat and I became a wallflower in the back of the class, I was hunting. I was always on the go, okay, who's the number one person in here? And, you know, was competitive in that respect, you know. So I took a look at this, and I didn't really ever see it as a problem, but it began to cause me problems, especially by the third and fourth grade, very punishing problems. Now, ADD uh, children, and especially as they grow into adults, tend to find themselves in situations uh, very consistently, for instance, is the classroom, as you've been talking about. And things don't tend to go so well for them, and it eventually begins to erode on them in life, and they begin to wonder, you know, what is wrong with me? How come I'm not getting it? Because they tend to be in environments that aren't very supportive or people who begin to nurture them as, oh, you're absolutely normal in an abnormal way, but in the most wonderful way. And it sounds like that's what you're talking about here. Well, you know, one thing, there's a couple of different comments I have for you, because uh, the first one is that, you know, I, when I work with these children and adults, one of the first things I say is that you have a disability, not a disability. You learn and process information 
differently right. than the average bear and that everything has been geared towards the average bear. So I'm going to teach you how to teach them how to teach you because they don't know how. And the same thing that stands true with adults is they need to be empowered to understand how they move through the world differently, not that it is wrong, that it is just differently. So they have to take more responsibility. In, in my new book, Managing the Gift of Your ADHD Child, uh, you know, I have this whole section called Painting Your Child's Portrait, and that the parent needs to go through and paint their child's portrait. They need to really understand on a number of different levels who their child is, and then at the beginning, advocate for the child to get things presented the way that they need it, and then as time goes on, teach the child to advocate for themselves as early as possible, because teaching that child to advocate for themselves is what empowers the child and creates a successful ADHD adult who says, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just this is the way I need it. You know, I, I need it this way. Uh, you know, this is how I'm going to get it. You want me to get it? Give it to me this way. This is how I get it. Um, and don't tell me I need to do it that way because it's always been done that way because that's what makes it easier for you. Because, you know, especially when it comes to the place of a, a child, a very bright child, a very high energy creative child, learning, um, it, you know, it doesn't register as important pieces of information or even information that makes sense of I should become less because it's easier for you. Where does that, where does that benefit my reality? Where does it benefit my reality to be something I'm not or to even try to pretend to be something I'm not? or to, um, you know, somehow try to be less because it makes it easier for you. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be all about me. You know, this is my time. This is supposed to be about me. So from that perspective, you know, it's how we look at it, which is why I have been really pushing this um, concept for a long time of, Let's get it out of the disability category and let's get it into the evolutionary process category because if we acknowledge that there have been increasing numbers of these individuals and they have been coming through in several generations now, we are forced to either extend, expand, or recreate the institutions to support them to fit in how they learn, how they function. We need to stop trying to carve them back to fit into what is a no longer functional institution. We need to expand the institution to include them because they're not going away. They are expanding us and their numbers are expanding. So we have to accommodate them, not medicate them. Um, as far as the whole hunters and gatherers thing, I'm very familiar with that. I know Tom Hartman uh, and he did a lot of stuff with the hunters and gatherers thing. I'm going to go back to an evolutionary process because, again, the old mentality of the hunter was being on high alert and being very aware and could both multitask and I, I suspect could hyperfocus. I, I don't know. I, I don't remember my caveman days. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that, 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 I, I mean, people, people may tell you I've had caveman moments, but I don't remember my caveman days. Um, and so, but in that, it was still a very simpler life, you know. Now, we have created a highly complicated life where if you took a poor, if you took one of the original hunters that we're referring to that this all this is, is, is a part of is this hunters and gatherers type of mentality, you took those hunters and you put them on Wall Street today, they'd probably die of, uh, of, a, of a stress, anxiety, heart attack, failure, or would have to be gunned down because they would kill everything in sight within half a day. Now, there are pros and cons to that. We could put them in Washington. That might do some good. Um, but I think we need to look at the fact that these individuals are a much stepped-up version of that, you know, which is to you know, kind of say, well, you know, we have a typewriter and it has a keyboard, and so that's comparing that typewriter, that old Smith Corona typewriter with the big clunky keys to the same keyboard that is now on my iPad. 
well, yeah, they both have a keyboard, but I wouldn't exactly put them in the same class. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me this day and age when you bring up keyboard with the advent of cell phones that you have advertising and television and everything just hammering everybody that society is becoming more and more ADD and you know, maybe it is an evolutionary process. Well, you know, part of that is is that with each generation of ADD, HD individuals, what's happened is that they have made the way for more ADD, HD individuals. You know, they're creating a world that is friendlier to them. That's part of what makes it an evolutionary process is, you know, an evolutionary process both is an adjustment to the environment and adjusts the environment. So the, the children that were born after Einstein or Edison or Graham Bell had more to work with mm -hmm. so they could take it farther. And now we do have a world where you often hear people go, well, I think everybody's a little ADD. I think everybody has to be a little ADD to function in this world. And when we look, who created this world we have to function in? The ADD HD brain. What kind of world is it going to create? One right. that it likes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, of course, which again is why our education system is falling so far behind because it's not teaching fully for the world we've created. It's, it's teaching for a, a late 19th century, like 20th century, early, early 20th century world in the 21st century. Amazing just how things are changing in that direction where it's becoming more. We had on the program actually uh, a doctor who was talking about how we tend to live in a society now that celebrates being over-focused, you know, staying in the beta state too much and it's burning people out. And he was teaching people how to back off of that a little bit, you know, to kind of open and relax a little bit. Then you'd become more creative. And what's interesting about ADD, ADHD, at least from my experiences, when you get into a world of noise, you can tend to do that all on your own, and you start, as you said earlier in the program, focusing on the things that capture your interest rather than focusing on everything. <laughs> and you can see where being so-called a little abnormal actually can benefit you. Well, and part of it is, is that you're scoping around and you're saying, Okay, right now everything is capturing my attention, you know. And there's the old joke, and you know, when I hear this, it's like somebody will start saying, "Yeah, you know about ADD rabbit." Oh, you know about ADD rabbit, you know. And it's like, well, you know why they said rabbit it was because you weren't holding their attention, you weren't interesting enough. So they noticed the rabbit because you weren't interesting enough, or what you were saying didn't capture them enough. Now, again. I'm going to modify that just a little bit, Daniel, with that there are things that exacerbate it, diet being one of them. Uh, a, an ADHD child on the average American diet is going to fall into the nightmare category pretty easily because it's a really bad diet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I uh, wrote a blog recently, and people can go to my, my website, mydrkevin.com, uh, mydrkevin.com. They can go there and they can get access to my blogs. This blog I'm talking about, uh, or any of them, because I put them out all the time, is I call one called "I'm So Excited." You know, and there was the old Pointer Sister song. You know, "I'm So Excited." Right. And I was so excited in that blog because Web WebMD, one of the top, you know, voices of, you know, the traditional Western medicine on the web actually came out and said, maybe, maybe, just maybe, we might want to look at the fact that what we feed a child could affect their behaviors, their moods, and how they act out in the world. Maybe. I'm like, how many years of education and how many people with how many years of education did it take to come up with that statement? When any parent going that spends a half a minute paying attention to their child will tell you, when I feed them this, they become a nightmare. Was that really rocket science? Right. You know? And yet, every time I try to say, start with diet, oh, yeah, yeah, we all heard diet, 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 like that's going to make a difference. Well, yes, it is. It's not the only difference that needs to be made, but it's the first difference you want to make. And then from diet, there are, a ton of, there are you know, many other steps you can build on to do things to create 
the kind of support systems and the kind of environment where this ADHD child or adult can shine, can let their passion out, can let their creativity out, can let their genius out. But if you have the other, if you have a lot of the other good stuff in place, but you're still feeding them the horrendous average American diet, they're still going to have some meltdowns. There are going to be times when they can't focus literally because they are in a brain fog that has been introduced by food that has nothing to do with ADHD. Wow. Now tell us about your website, what people, I mean, this is such an extensive topic and unfortunately we're running short on time, but tell us uh, what people can find out from your website. Well, if people come to my website, again, it's mydrkevin.com, um, they, first of all, if they um, sign up to be on my to, to uh, be on my website, they get an excerpt of my new book, uh, Managing the Gift of Your ADHD Child, and then they have access to the blogs, which they can also get through my fan page on Facebook. But you can do the, all that through my website. And I'm always writing. There's always some tips or techniques or different ways to look at things. I'm also putting out things that other people are doing that are very successful that fall into recognizing more of the gift and are less disability focused and are less and are less medicated focused because you know my big thing is manage not medicate so becoming part of the website uh you know I share my own stuff and other stuff that me and my staff you know find that's out there that are things that are working things that are helpful because unfortunately we have been we as a culture in this country, have become addicted to fast food mentality. We want it all through a drive-through window. We want to get up in the morning. We want to get our food through a drive-through window. We want to put our dry cleaning through a drive-through window. If we could create a drive-through window where we could pass our kids off, we would do that as well. Uh, and we have drive-through pharmacies where we can get our prescriptions. So we can take all the right pills through the day to be able to manage to to take that day um, and kind of apathetically have a drug haze to survive through it. And so one of the things I have to tell people, unfortunately, is there is no one-size-fits-all solution. I can't give you a magic wand. I can't give you... You have a child or you have a spouse or somebody you care about. They really are a unique, one-of-a-kind individual. And I can tell you some things and give you some tips and some are going to work better on some people and some work better on others because even as they're an individual, there are places where they cross over Daniel. You know, if somebody is an external processor, they're an external processor. There are things that we can do that you want to do with an external processor that are different than an internal processor, but they are still a unique combination. And, uh, you know, so I can't give everybody a fast food solution. I can't give you a one-pill-fits-all solution that's really going to allow you or any other ADHD child or adult who truly step into their greatness, into their brilliance, into their creativity. It's going to take a little bit of hard work, a hard, hard work where everybody wins at the end. Sounds wonderful. Go ahead and give your website again. It's mydrkevin.com, M-Y-D-R-K-E-V-I-N.com. Dr. Kevin, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Well, thank you for having me, Daniel. Thank you. We also want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at our website, beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50. We do have a free weekly e-newsletter for you to sign up for as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Again, thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.